Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to our ninth EGAP morning briefing on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm Henning Hoff, executive editor of Internationale Politik Quarterly. Russian President Vladimir Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine enters its 10th week. I think we are in day 63. As you all know, the war is in a new phase, concentrated on the east and the south of Ukraine, where fierce battles are taking place. So far, however, they have not brought a significant breakthrough for either side. There are ominous signs, however, that the Russians may be opening another front in Moldova to the west of Ukraine in the breakaway region of Transnistria occupied by Russian forces for decades, so-called peacekeepers. Evidence of war crimes committed by Russian forces continue um, to amass attempts by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who visited Moscow this week for talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin to involve the UN in a humanitarian mission to relieve Mariupol have brought no results. Meanwhile, the EU is preparing a thick a sanction package, which will probably or possibly include an oil embargo. In any case, German economy and climate minister Robert Habeck managed to strike a deal with Poland this week regarding alternative oil supplies for the PCK refinery in Schwedt at the German-Polish border. This refinery is owned by Rosneft and supplies Berlin and much of North and Eastern Germany with gasoline. Um, Moscow has reacted to this news by stopping gas supplies for Poland and Bulgaria in an apparent warning to Germany not to support an oil embargo. There are also considerable movement on the question of military aid to Ukraine with a 40 nation meeting conveyed by the US administration at the US air base in Rammstein. German defense minister, minister Ms. Christine Lamprecht confirmed that Berlin would green light the delivery of 50 Gepard anti-aircraft tanks a perceived U-turn on the part of Olaf Scholz, Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the SPD in particular, who were until somewhat skeptical to say the least regarding sending heavy weapons. To discuss all this and more, we have three experts with us this morning to assess the situation. Good morning to everybody. Um, in line with uh, how we usually do these briefings, please allow me to share my screen. This is the strategic, strategic situation uh, in the front line from yesterday afternoon. Just as the previous week, the main focus of fighting is still Eastern Ukraine. So this region, um, basically Luhansk and Donetsk regions, Russia is already controlling Luhansk region almost fully. Uh, really a few towns and villages are still in Ukrainian hands but Ukrainian forces are retreating. Uh, situation is slightly more stable in Donetsk. Ukraine still controls considerable, considerable parts of Donetsk, uh, including Slavyansk, Gramatorsk, and a number of important other cities. However, Russian offensive is ongoing. Uh, the big news here, if I show another map, a more detailed one, this is the situation we see in, uh, this is in a larger resolution, uh, the situation in Eastern Ukraine. And you see from the red lines or for the red uh, stripes, that Russian armed forces are now advancing very meticulously in parallel columns with the columns supporting each other. This is the type of warfare Russia knows how to conduct. G going uh, forward slowly with strong artillery support and taking a good use of their superiority in numbers and military technology. That at the moment, Ukraine is fighting hard, but Ukrainian forces are in the need of retreating slowly, gradually, but still retreating. At the moment, it doesn't seem that Russia, that anything would stop Russia from continuing this way of, uh, of going forward. The, it's unlikely that there would be any kind of major breakthrough. So the, the, the cauldron or the encirclement of Ukrainian forces, it doesn't seem to be realistic, at least not yet, but still this gradual Russian advance is, is likely to continue. Uh, if we go back to the strategic map, another important point of fighting is in the Mikolaev region, here's some Mikolaev region. Um, even though the Russian main effort is concentrated in eastern Ukraine, still Russia is putting up a hard fight um, 
between Herzl and Nikolaev. And there has been a Russian effort also going north from the Herzl region directed at Krivirich. Uh, it's just a side effort, but still Russia apparently has enough time, enough force to conduct offensive operations, also regions outside of Eastern Ukraine. Few words about Transnistria. Uh, the Russian objective seems to be to destabilize Moldova from within. Uh, a military escalation, however, is unlikely simply because the separatists are, you all know it, the Transnistria region located basically here that I'm pointing with the mouse. Transnistria is sandwiched between Ukraine and Moldova. Transnistria is 100% dependent on uh, supplies coming through Ukraine, energy supplies, and their trade is also dependent on, how put it, the, the goodwill of uh, Ukraine and Moldova. So most probably the Transnistrian elites are also not interested in any kind of military escalation. Yes, tensions are high, and there are checkpoints set up. Transnistria ordered a red level uh, anti-terror alert, and more attacks are likely to happen. However, we do not see military mobilization on either of the sides. It's actually good news that Transnistria ordered an anti-terror alert and not some kind of a military alert. So it looks like that the separatist elites are also trying to kind of mitigate the tensions. Uh, another good news, any kind of military escalation from the Russian side is unlikely because from the technical perspective, it's simply impossible. Russia has around 1,500 soldiers partly peacekeepers in Transnistria, but these forces are badly trained, not really motivated. They are not in the uh, shape of conducting any offensive operations. And for Russia, it's practically impossible to give any reinforcements or to send any reinforcements to Transnistria. The only way to do that would have been via airlift, but Ukraine said it several times that it will shoot down Russian transport aircrafts. Uh, any kind of amphibious operations is also unlikely and impossible at the same time. So the good news here that even though tensions are likely to remain high in Transnistria, probably go even higher, a large scale military escalation that would threaten Odessa or that would threaten the territorial integrity of Moldova anymore, it's, uh, it's practically, I mean, almost impossible. That's the good news. So that's it from my side. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you. Many thanks, Andras. Maybe just one quick question, because we were discussing heavy weapons uh, so so intensely uh, the last couple of, of days and, and weeks. Uh, is the Ukrainian army sort of how well are they equipped and, and what sort of weapons would make a difference in your view? You, um, we know there is very little open source information about the actual status of the Ukrainian army. However, but we know that their losses are heavy, both in, in, in terms of trained and, and, and professional soldiers and also in terms of heavy equipment. What they need the most is artillery, ammunition, uh, air defense, tanks. And one more thing, which is not that much in the German discussion, but it should be, it's not only about the fighting vehicles, it's also about the transporters. Because you know it very well, tanks and tracked vehicles don't move on the roads on their tracks, because that's bad for the tracks, bad for the roads. So you need to transport these vehicles from one part of Ukraine to another part, uh, and uh, the vehicles go on their own tracks only in the very last phase. So actually when they go into fighting. So you, besides heavy weapons, tanks, artillery, air defense, uh, Ukraine also would need more transport vehicles to be able to move this heavy weaponry across the country. This would actually count as non-military assistance. But right now, particularly because the war in the East is an attrition type of war. So basically it's in the very end, it will be around numbers, Ukraine desperately needs whatever they can get. Artillery is the number one priority. They're after tanks, they're after air defense, they're after everything else. I hope this helps. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, let's turn to Wilfried now um, for uh, some, some um, comments on the situation in Russian occupied parts of Ukraine. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, focus so far uh, on the south of Ukraine. Uh, the south of Ukraine is at the moment not uh, at the center maybe of attention because the main campaign of Russian offensive is going on in the east. But uh, in the south of Ukraine, actually, we can uh, see the intensification of efforts of Russian Federation to enroot administrative and political structures uh, of Russia or the so-called separatist, uh, separatist republics. 
before I go into detail, uh, a few words. Um, we have to be clear that the question of annexation of territories uh, of the north, Kharkiv, uh, or of the south, uh, are still on the table of Russian Federation. Uh, we have here ongoing disputes between two groups uh, within uh, the, the Kremlin. Um, uh, that is one group which is much more, red uh, more radical than the other. That does not mean that they not both hate uh, the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian nation. The first group is actually the deputy uh, head of administration of president of Russia, Sergei Kirienko, who is now the new curator of the new occupied territories and replaced Mr. Kozak. Um, we have also people like Dmitry Medvedev, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, and the Minister of Dissent, uh, Shoigu. They actually try to, to cement their loyalty and to show up their loyalty before Putin. And they are especially no. radical when it comes uh, to the extermination uh, of the Ukrainians as a nation as such, and uh, the weakening of the, or the, the extermination of the Ukrainian state. The other group, uh, which is um, actually um, uh, followed, for example, by people like Dmitry Peskov, Premier Minister Mikhail Mishustin, they are more concerned about the consequences of sanctions. They, of course, also want uh, to, uh, let me say, fragment the Ukrainian state to expand uh, Russian territory. But when it comes to uh, actions directly, uh, um, directed uh, primarily uh, against uh, the Ukrainian nation, uh, that is also including war crimes, they are a little bit less radical. And uh, behind, uh, against to the background of that, uh, we uh, cannot still say that for, example, uh, that, for example, in the South, we will see uh, a Kherson People's Republic uh, as a part of the DNR groups or another formation of DNR Republic. That is uh, still a little bit unclear. What we can see in the South is, um, for example, um, when it comes to, to administrative, administrative political measures, we will see maybe at the beginning of May, the introduction of the ruble zone uh, in the Kherson, uh, in the Kherson uh, Oblast, and also maybe uh, in parts of Zaporizhian Oblast. Um, we, uh, what we see now is um, the expropriation of Kherson uh, farm industry in order to use the products of Ukrainian farmers to the, for the supply of Crimea. What we secondly also see uh, um, at the same time in the agrarian uh, territories of the Luhansk Oblast in the east is also to use uh, the grain and uh, the, the agrarian products for export, for example, to the Krasnodar regions and other regions uh, to Russia. And we have uh, in Kherson, where we have also many protests still going on against the Russian occupation, we can see uh, ongoing kidnapping of people. And that kidnapping of people is actually directed on local politicians, priests, and journalists in order, amongst other aims, to form so-called blacklists to continue persecution of what I, what I would uh, say um, the local, the local pro-Ukrainian elites. Uh, the next point is um, uh, what I also want uh, to tell you um, is that Russia has big problems to manage the cities uh, uh, which is, uh, is, it has occupied uh, in the last months. Uh, Russia has simply or is lacking professional staff for managing the city uh, councils and the administrations. They try to recruit actually collaborators from the former opposition platform for life, which is, which is a successor party of the former party of regions. Uh, but they have big problems, for example, in Kherson, where we still not know who is really ruling the city. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have already no Ukrainian mayor. So from uh, we have already a de facto mayor. Of course, we have still a Ukrainian mayor. But uh, the Russians try to install women, which is obviously uh, not, uh, not able to really effectively manage the city. 
how are the Russians approaching the people in the occupied territories? Um, when you, for example, speak with mayors who were kidnapped, like the mayor of Melitopol, where I, I had with him a conversation, uh, they uh, say that they have to liberate these regions from uh, fascism. Uh, they have to liberate the regions uh, from the rubbering and failed uh, bandit regime of Mr. Zelensky and Kiev. Um, and uh, they have to protect uh, the Russian language in these regions, what, what is very interesting because Russian language is, uh, of, as you know, maybe very widespread in the regions. And uh, um, what you see is, however, that there is a transformation of ideology going on. Uh, you see that there is even no systematic approach when they try to widespread propaganda. There are no structural systematic message about messages about the Russian world. Uh, so uh, even the soldiers or the occupation forces or the heads of the occupation forces are, are often not uh, able to explain the people why, why they are there. That is very interesting. And we had just a conference in Petersburg with academians of the Russian federations where they actually put in question these uh, the Putin's conception of uh, new Russia and the Russian world because uh, they they told uh, and that it was an official conference officially um, uh, supported that uh, obviously these concepts are not working to integrate uh, the regions and there was also a big concern that um, uh, in the future Russia will have big problems uh, to integrate uh, different different peoples and this is interesting uh, uh, things going on um, what I uh, what I also uh, want to say is um, what is very important to understand um, why regions why cities who voted in the past even, to a higher extent for pro-Russian parties than some cities in the Donbas are now protesting. That is, of course, at first, um, the very brutal occupation policy uh, of Russian Federation. But what is obvious, it is also maybe a success, the first success of the decentralization reform. What we see when we speak with mayors and local authorities is that they, um, actually uh, ask you as a German, please support further the resilience of decentralization, even in the time of war, because decentralization gave us a possibility to, uh, to develop a local patriotism, which in the end worked at, uh, um, at favor for the Ukrainian state. That is also a very interesting thing. Um, Having said that about uh, the South, I will now give you some tendencies, so that is my last part, some tendencies about war crimes. And I think what is very important is uh, for us here to understand that uh, the invasion of Russia is not only an invasion for expansion of territory, it is an invasion which is aimed uh, to exterminate the national Ukrainian element as an ethnic national ele element as such. And uh, if we call it genocide or not, I think that is maybe now too early to make a clear assessment about that, but we have very clear indicators. It is important to understand this dimension, that political dimension of the conflict in order to really sufficiently support in the fight of existence at the moment. What I only want, to, I want only to pay your attention, for example, on deportations. Uh, we have uh, mass deportations from new occupied territories uh, to the so-called uh, People's Republics, as well as to Russian Federation, uh, up to the eastern regions in Magadan and Kamchatka. Uh, uh, at the uh, 21st of April, we can speak about uh, about a million of people deported in these territories. Uh, we have in these territories uh, facts of uh, forced uh, forced labor, actually in the eastern in the eastern regions. We have also now the growing fact that children and not only orphans, but maybe con consciously. Uh, uh, children were, which were consciously separated from their parents 
uh, being deported to the eastern regions. And at the same time, we have uh, um, changes in Russian legislation to ease the adoption of these ch Ukrainian children uh, by uh, Russian parents. That is only one indicator where you see that you have a clear direction on uh, um, undermining and exterminating a national element of Ukraine. And the last thing, what we have, what we had also in the South, but what you heard, of course, about uh, the Kievan regions, uh, where, um, which have been liberated uh, from, um, uh, from, from, the, from the Russian occupations, uh, you heard about uh, the mass crimes there. Uh, we had in these regions, but not only there, also in the south, we had arbitrary killing of civilians. Uh, we now also have new mass graves uh, uh, in, in the south and also in the Kievan regions. And what we can say here is that we have uh, uh, killings uh, um, or that we have um, killed people who died because they were Ukrainians. That is a very important thing. And what is very interesting, if you look on, on the topography where war crimes uh, took place, you actually have war crimes in the more richer cities and villages around Kiev and in the south. So that is so that are those settlements where actually uh, you have houses of what I would say, uh, a little, uh, um, let me say, a rather richer middle class of Ukraine. And that is also very, very telling. Um, and um, another, another thing is, of course, uh, the raping of women, uh, which is a big problem, actually, for those women who are now in Poland, because they have big problems, for example, uh, with uh, psychological help. And also the problem of abortion is a very big problem. Um, and all these things um, uh, fill up a picture which is very, very worrying. And I think without understanding that, um, uh, we, we have no compass uh, to really support uh, the Ukrainians and to really understand what is going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilfried. I'll let, let you talk a little longer than usual. Um, uh, Excuse which is me. Chilling and 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 uh, because, because I think we, we discuss these these things a little too 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 infrequently here in Germany. Let's now turn on to um, uh, to Jana, please, for for her assessment of the maybe the latest U-turn or the sort of two steps forward, one step back um, approach which the Scholz government has taken to the conflict so far. Jana, please. Thank you, Henning. Um, it is a great pleasure to be with my DGAP colleagues again. Uh, it's always. Uh, very insightful to listen uh, to Andras and Wilfried. Um, and it's also very nice to see some familiar faces within the audience or to read some familiar names. Um, I have very good and fun memories of my time at DGAP. What I want to do um, is to take a bit uh, a broader picture and to give you my assessment of um, where we are with the Zeitenwende uh, or what has happened. And I know this is a very controversial topic, um, so we can maybe discuss this um, later, but I just wanted to share some thoughts that I'm having right now um, about where we're going as a country. Um, and I know that it's pretty early to do this. Um, it's eight weeks after the speech. Uh, we should give the government some time. Um, I know that this cannot be done overnight. This will be a long process. Um, but nevertheless, I think there are some worrying tendencies that lead me to think that basically the speech in itself is for many already mission accomplished. Um, and um, the ambition might be, I think, a little, um, yeah, too little to, to, to live up to the challenges um, ahead of us. I actually thought that the speech was um, great. Um, and very timely. Uh, and I was completely surprised to hear many of the announcements because I wouldn't have thought that they were um, possible, uh, especially from an SPD um, chancellor. So I was very impressed. Um, and I really had the impression that um, in the speech, it became obvious that there was really an awareness that we are entering new times and that this was not only uh, about the war, I mean, the war maybe was the curtain riser, the, the moment that uh, brought it 
all uh, kind of out um, uh, into the light, but something that for me um, was already visible uh, for a long time, and that is not only limited to the role that Russia plays, but also to the role that China plays, and kind of this is about the new international order. Um, and I thought uh, in the speech, what was important for me that, that um, Chancellor uh, Scholz um, acknowledged that this was basically about our freedom, our democracy, and our prosperity that was in existential danger, um, and that the, the war in Ukraine was a threat not only to Ukraine, but basically to, to all of us. Um, I think that there was kind of a moment of clarity and a moment of unity um, very feasible in Germany. Um, and I was impressed also by the broad consensus in the German Bundestag, the support behind the arms deliveries, uh, the far-reaching sanctions against Russia, the strengthening of NATO's eastern flank, the special fund uh, for the Bundeswehr, the Sondervermögen. Um, but yeah, but kind of eight weeks later, and I, I get that also from talking to delegations from other countries who come and ask me kind of where does Germany stand and what do we really mean by Zeitenwende? And they very often also ask, where is Olaf Scholz uh, in all of this? I have the impression um, that, yeah, that the speech rose expectations that the government was not aware of the moment uh, the this, this speech was given. Um, so I'm wondering for a while now, what kind of the thinking was the moment the speech was given, because that was kind of three days after the war broke out. And I think with still the assumption in mind that Russia would win this war uh, quickly. That was at least my assumption. And I think, I think that was the assessment of pretty much everybody um, that this was basically, uh, would be a short war, uh, Russia would be victorious. Um, and so my impression right now is that because of this, the government basically was not aware that kind of they would rise uh, so many expectations also um, in other countries and that this was uh, read as a sign that Germany would now step up, show leadership, um, kind of grab the moment, rise to the opportunity. And um, yeah, and that the government was not aware of um, the challenges. And the problem I see is that as I said, it takes time to implement the Zeitenwende. I think it's a long process. Um, it's about reviewing, if it came to me, um, many policy areas, Russia policy, security and defense policy, yeah, also our economic um, policy and our whole approach to basically geopolitics. And um, so I'm just worried that the momentum at the moment is fading away um, or that it has already passed. Um, and I think what we see now is how difficult it is for politicians who have been uh, in government or have been around for a long time um, and have been socialized in a, in, a, in a way that makes it so hard now to basically implement a policy that goes against everything that they ever um, believed or every kind of everything that, that they were, um, that, that was part of their own socialization. Um, so I think we are not ambitious enough. We are not um, stepping up enough. Um, and it's so interesting because I think, and also that I, I see that when I talk to people, um, that it's really very clear of how you view the progress that we have done uh, and what we've achieved is very much dependent on where you've been before the speech. So, because for me, it was groundbreaking, but the things that were uh, announced um, were basically an attempt to catch up with reality. Um, the armed drones, for example, is something that our partners uh, already use for a long time. The um, F-35 decision was more than uh, necessary. Um, the 2% debate we had forever. And for me, it was like the speech brought us to, um, to a situation where we basically uh, we're able to do things that we have promised also with the NATO for a long time, but it did not prepare us um, for the future. And what I see now, and I don't only blame the government, but also the opposition, is that the that many of the, the things that I thought uh, were now a given are actually <laughs> not so clear cut. I was very happy to see the um, Gemeinsame Antrag yesterday um, from the um, 
from the government and the CDU CSU, but I think there is still a, a lot of unclarity about the Sonderfermögen, and that keeps me worried because as it stands now, and maybe some in the call can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that um, the defense budget will basically remain unchanged uh, or frozen at around 50 billion euros until 2026, and that the fund will be used to uh, basically fill the 2% gap um, over time. And that leaves us in a situation where in 2026, we basically fall back to square one uh, and we kick the can down the road. And so we will be able to fulfill um, the 2% goal for, for quite some time, but then not any longer, maybe, or that is completely unclear. And also um, whether it makes sense to do it the way uh, it is discussed now, because that would mean that we would need to spend not only 25 million euros a year for procurement, but even 35 um, a billion a year, um, at least uh, next year, uh, because of the, the, yeah, in order to fulfill the 2% goal. So I don't know if that is even all uh, doable. Um, also, when it comes to arms exports, I think we don't need to talk about that at length. We can, but um, I think it's, if, if you look at it now, I think Germany is firmly somewhere in the middle when it comes to the country's uh, middle of the road uh, approach. Now, I think uh, even, uh, 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 a, a bit ahead um, because of the uh, Gippard decision. Um, but I think the communication was a disaster and it's completely unclear what kind of line the government really um, has in mind, especially I think here the SPD, um, but there are some SPD representatives in the call, maybe they can shed light um, on this. And maybe to end, so what I would hope is that um, we would raise to the expectation and not lose the momentum and make it more clear to the people in Germany um, that this is now a very crucial time to implement some of the, the changes. I think this is about support for Ukraine, but I think this is also about preparing um, our NATO posture, um, about preparing us to defend our continent uh, in a time when it's by no means clear that the United States will be in Europe forever. And they have been so instrumental in managing this crisis and this war. Without the Americans, we would have been lost. And I think this is a situation that cannot stand um, as it is. I see a crucial role here for Germany, but I don't see us uh, raising to the, um, to the occasion. And also for me, that lessons learned from this Zeitenwende would also mean that we should rethink our relationship with China much more than we are currently doing this because we have experienced that we got completely dependent on one country in a crucial policy area. And when we look at our relationship with China, um, there are many um, dependencies that are security related that, that are not kind of, I think, really reflected. And so what I would hope for is that we, all of us can push the government in the next years to really go through the different portfolios and look whether they are Zeitenwende proof. And as I said, um, I have the impression that many in the government think that the speech and the decisions that were groundbreaking for many in the SPD and the Greens are already the end result. And for me, that is not enough. And maybe we can discuss this. Later. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jana. So if we, we are overrunning a little, um, um, so let's jump into the discussion right away. Um, I would like to, to echo um, Jana's uh, um, uh, sort of suggestion that that that's, uh, um, MPs who are on the call maybe maybe want to jump in um, on the discussion as well. But um, let's first turn to to Stefan Meister, uh, uh, the um, head of the uh, International Order and Democracy Program here at the German Council of Foreign Relations, and and one of Germany's leading Russia experts. Stefan, please come in. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, don't, I don't want to, uh, to do here like a co-presentation. Co I just wanted, um, I had one thing I wanted to say about Moldova, because I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then I wanted to ask uh, Wilfried uh, one question. Um, I think uh, uh, Anders also made very clear that this is not a new front, uh, yeah, so there's not a new front um, against Ukraine, but I think it's, it's, it's much more about Moldova itself, which is very vulnerable, uh, it's not able to defend itself, and it has a divided society, um, uh, which is also under 
uh, uh, very much influenced by Russian disinformation um, campaign. And I think for me, the key issue is here that this is the most pro Western, um, pro European government, reform government, also compared to Ukraine uh, before the war. Yeah, you can, you can say in, um, at the moment in the Eastern neighborhood. And I think uh, for me, the main, main issue is that there could be a coup. Uh, uh, yeah, in uh, in Moldova, I think that 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 is the main danger uh, for me. It's very easy. Uh, it, it it's not able to defend itself. Um, you can find people inside of Moldova, um, and uh, you can uh, um, you can have uh, in Moldova what you not had in Ukraine from a Russian perspective: um, um, uh, regime change from within uh, with uh, with a group um, who supports Russia, and you can organize this very easily. And it's a, it's a cheap victory also towards the EU. So I think that is the main threat for me um, I, I see at the moment um, in, 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 in uh, Moldova. I just wanted to, to add this. Um, I want to ask Wilfried, because you, you mentioned, uh, you were talking about uh, the, the areas where, where most of the people were, were, let's say, I don't know if this is right, systematically killed. That would be also a question um, uh, around Kiev um, and other uh, territories. You mentioned that this is, this is mainly middle class um, people. Can you explain what do you mean? So is there, is there really a system, was there a systematic behind it? Or is it, is it just a culture of violence which we have in Russia? Yeah, and also in the Russian army, there's a culture of violence also against their own people. Uh, and then the same cruelty, maybe you have also, um, yeah, with this with regard to, to the people they, they attack. Do you see a systematic here? And do you see there a specific group which were targeted um, or just happened this by accident? I, I just want to understand the logic and also what do you mean also with this um, with middle class? Um, uh, maybe you can explain this. Thank you. Many thanks. Before we turn to answers, please let's uh, uh, get our colleague Florian Schimmel also into the discussion, Florence. Thank you, honey. I'm sorry for joining uh, you without a camera this morning, but uh, it's, it's great to see you all. And, and you too, Jana, my question goes to you. And I would like to come back to the point about the 100 billion that you made and ask whether you see any potential for the debate shifting from the quite arbitrary 2% um, goal to what kind of capabilities are needed. Because um, we now see that um, the uh, Bundeswehr, I mean, and we, we've all known that, <laughs> um, needs capabilities, but there's also a shift now from out of area crisis management as a priority back to defense. And um, I would be interested in, in, in your thoughts about um, how this might change what uh, money is actually spent for and what kind of capabilities might be needed. Um, maybe in relation to what is being delivered or not, whether that might impede any deliveries or not. And um, since the def defense spending cycles are much longer, and as you said, 2026 is just not something that gives a planning horizon that uh, that is uh, <laughs> that gives enough um, money security, so to say, to to, to really invest. Um, what kind of uh, yeah? What kind of discussions are you seeing in a change in capabilities that might be needed, or whether we can come to a discussion that focuses on capabilities both for defense, um, Landesbündnisverteidigung, and um, out of area uh, crisis management? Thank you. Many thanks. Um, maybe start with Wilfried, and um, maybe Andras wants to come in also on Moldova again. Um, um, I know you have to leave in a moment, so maybe that's it. Uh, let's start with Wilfried. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe a little comment on the chat uh, of uh, Mr. Juncker. Thank you very much for your question about filtration measures and filtration camps, which are connected to deportations. Um, yes, uh, I think these crimes will be addressed. There is, at the moment, there are different efforts in Ukraine to document these crimes and to give these crimes uh, to accountability platforms, for example, in Poland. Um, I can say, uh, because I'm also involved in that, that Germany also is now implementing a documentation platform in Germany, actually uh, to uh, give information to the public about these cases. Uh, thank you much for that. Uh, on Stefan's question, Stefan, yes, I'm, as I said, yes, uh, I'm very careful at the moment to give a clear assessment if that is a genocide or not. Uh, what I'm speaking about is some tendencies that we have actually, um, that, that those villages and little cities um, fall under victim of heavy war crimes, where you actually, um, let me say, 
have a more uh, richer settlements, while those villages who have also something to sell, let me say, yes, and where, where also you have uh, shops and other things, were not were not uh, uh, um, treated as well. And uh, some specialists are speaking here about tendencies. Uh, what I, but what I think what is more important is that um, under that uh, when we speak about the killings of civilians, what we can see is that uh, uh, actually a man who did not show up, um, let me say, um, uh, a, a correct or wished behavior, uh, they were killed. And that is not only, uh, they, and, and I do not speak about resistance by force. Um, I speak, for example, only about protests, or uh, they told um, you, why are you here? You are an occupier. You, you, I, I don't want to admit uh, you're the, to step into my house and something like that. Um, and uh, many of these peoples were killed under the messages uh, that they are uh, nationalists, that they are defending uh, uh, Ukraine, fascist Ukraine, and all these things. I mean, we have, of course, we have to study that. Um, but um, what we see is that soldiers um, are also used uh, national argumentation for legitimizing these crimes. However, I think it is also, of course, connected to the very low uh, culture uh, and discipline in the Russian uh, army, because we have a brutalization of Russian army all, already since the, Chet uh, the, the wars in Chechnya. Uh, the second point is that we obviously uh, obviously see that uh, Russian soldiers in Ukraine were not equipped by a very good log logistics. And very early, the officers uh, permitted plundering of uh, Ukrainian cities. So I think that is all very intervened. And therefore, it is very important um, to, uh, to analyze that very precisely and not to give your uh, legal assessments before having uh, more documentation. So I think what we can say at the moment, that if we take the whole picture, also the destructions of critical in civil infrastructure, which is important for the survival of civil population and which took place from the first day of, uh, of the war, uh, then we can, I think, admit that and and if we also take together that with the uh, with the speeches of Putin's and with the uh, um, uh, with the statements uh, um, on the Ukrainian nation, which does simply not exist for them, then I think we can say in a in a political assessment that these actions are di directed to to um, undermine to to weaken or even to exterminate. Uh, um, an, uh, a national Ukrainian element which is distinct from so-called all Russian commonality myths. Um, I think that we can state already now. And all these other things I would like to inform you about tendencies which have now to be investigated very precisely. Thank you for that. Many thanks, Wilfried. Uh, Andras, one maybe final comment then from you. Yes, uh, we got a question from Mr. Peter Gottwald in the chat uh, about um, the U.S. declaration on, on, on the, the need to weaken Russia to such an extent that it couldn't commit another aggression in, in Ukraine. Here I would like to add one thing, bad news. I already typed it in the chat, but still, uh, any kind of calculations we have on Russia's military capabilities, these calculations are true only as long as Russia is not in a state of war. Because if Russia decides to, to put an end to the special operation narrative and say that, okay, we are at war and introduce martial law and state of war by only Apologenia, that would enable Putin to mobilize tens, if not hundreds of thousands of soldiers in a few months' time. And that would fundamentally alter the military balance, the political balance, even the economic balance. So we need to really watch the Russian domestic discourse on whether the, the Kremlin is preparing for declaring a state of war, or are they going to maintain this special military operation narrative? This is really important. Thank you.
Thanks very much, uh, Andras. There is indeed a sort of sort of speculation about the, the May the 9th, um, whether that's the point where 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 the Putin regime may sort of flip this narrative and, and, and widen the war to, to an even greater extent. Um, is, thank you very much, Andras. You, you're excused if you, if you just fade away. Um, uh, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And Jana, maybe you want to tackle the, the, um, the uh, maybe what's soon be called the 100 billion dollar, not dollar, sorry, euro question of this Sondervermögen, which which also uh, as, as a journalist maybe should should sort of uh, uh, sort of the, the media pretends that everyone knows what a Sondervermögen is. Of course, Sondervermögen is uh, something <laughs> we need to have in the in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the um in the Grundgesetz. And one wonders why we need something which is only there for four years needs to be implemented in the in the in the constitution. But um Jana please. Um, maybe I can say a word um, to another question that was um, in the chat, whether kind of how do I explain uh, kind of Scholz's difficult to understand approach and maybe his caution and whether he has information that we don't have or that he doesn't share and whether he knows something about Russia's intentions that we don't. And this is, um, I'm not in a position to answer this. I think that would be speculative. But maybe I can say a few words um, of things that I'm pretty sure about. Um, so what I heard uh, in background conversations is that um, I think in the chancery, people are convinced that rather than losing this war, Russia will escalate. So this scenario um, that they always present as kind of accidentally triggering um, World War III is I think not only a kind of a cheap excuse uh, because they are not willing to do things, but um, I think they are, they are really worried. And this is, um, I think this is very, th their worry is very credible. Um, I would always argue that it's not in our hands because Putin basically can decide or can take whatever, uh, whatever thing we do as, a reason to say, okay, that's now uh, how they cross the red line, and this is uh, this is kind of my trigger, because I think it's a political decision on the other side. Uh, but I think what the government tries to, or how it approaches it, is that it's kind of tiptoeing on a volcano. That is that is their impression, and they kind of slowly, slowly try to to inch forward and to look what can what they can do and what is responsible. Um, and I think this is generally a, a good thing, but I think Russia is very good in playing this game and intimidating um, us because they, as, as Lavrov has just uh, made uh, kind of brilliantly in, in, his, in his speech, kind of this, kind of to always have this nuclear uh, escalation scenario. And this is, we have to re remind ourselves, present since day three of the war. So it's not that it started after the Gephardt decision or it is, it is always there. So I think it's only partly in our hands. What I also think drives decisions is that it's not uh, like uh, what the United States claim that we need to weaken Russia as much as possible. I think there is a fear that a weakened Russia is not in our interest because um, not because of our good relationship and our energy supply, but because of uh, kind of strategic stability in Europe and uh, kind of as I said, rather than losing, escalating, but also uh, kind of what an imploding Russian Russian state would mean. So um, I think that they are much more cautious um, in, in aiming for, for weakening Russia. Um, and I think what I, what I found interesting myself is that the ambition, especially when it comes to arms exports, was never to be a leading nation, but was always to be a middle of the road nation. Uh, it was not the ambition to, to leave this. And I think that is understandable from an SPD perspective, where the sheer and the green perspective, where the sheer decision to send weapons uh, was first and foremost already kind of a perceived uh, breaking of a of a taboo. So, um, but but I'm so used to asking my government to step up and to do more um, that I, I I found this uh, an interesting observation. And from uh, conversations I had with other governments, is that actually other governments understand this and, and are less critical than um, some is, is sometimes, um, I don't know, uh, the impression when you look at Twitter or, or, or the talk shows. The Ukrainians, of course, are very critical, but the, the, the Czech government or also the, the, the Scandinavian countries, they are puzzled and wondering 
that's my impression. They don't know why we do what we do, but it's not that they are worried that we are kind of the loose cannon uh, in the West or kind of the weak link. That, that is not the case. And at least from the conversations I had recently, and I tried to ask specifically about this. Maybe now on the 2% um, goal and the capability. So I understand that the 100 billion um, as a kind of a number came from the assessment, what have we promised in NATO and what do we need to basically procure? So it's very capabilities um, oriented and very territorial defense um, oriented. And I think many things of the 100 billion are already earmarked, like the, um, like the, uh, to, uh, to, succession to the tornado, the heavy uh, transport, helicopter, munition. Um, ammunition is, is, is supposed to be 30 billion alone. And so um, I think um, that, that um, I think the 2% goal is a symbolic goal. So Germany now kind of wants, wants to do this. I think we cannot fall um, behind this. Uh, I think that is a promise that we made and other countries have basically um, followed. So I think there is a lot of pressure now in NATO uh, to, to fulfill this. That's why I'm also so worried. Um, we now approach this that, that kind of with the logic of the finance minister. This is a Sondervermögen that doesn't count um, for the uh, kind of for national debt, and we need to spend it within this kind of um, budget uh, period. And that means basically that we need to buy a lot off the shelf, that kind of existing material um, but a lot of European countries are, are worried uh, kind of what happens with joint procurement, uh, European kind of joint development, and, and are, we, are we able to invest sufficiently in this, or are we just buying off the shelf American weapons? So is this kind of beneficial for Europe uh, in a way, or, or isn't it? That is, that is what is, and, and, and actually I really think it's a problem to spend that much money in such a short amount of time. Um, and, and to process uh, to process this, so I it, I don't know. I'm maybe I think Ulrich Kieselwetter, my former boss, is on the call and can maybe shed some light whether this is at least feasible or whether that is going to change now in the debate. Because I think that the CDU is not really on board with um, what the government has in mind. Uh, but I don't know if if there is uh, room for maneuver. Thank you very much, Jana. We've got five minutes left, two questions still. Um, unfortunately, there were three in, in, a moment ago, um, but let's let's uh, take the two questions and then we maybe each of you can, can respond um, and pick up the questions um, um, you, you like. There was always a very interesting one about the state of negotiations between Russia and, and, and Ukraine. Um, but let's now turn to Stephen Pope, please. Thank you very much and good morning and firstly, thank you very, very much. This is such an important um, discussion forum and I'm extremely grateful that we're available um, to engage in such a discussion. Um, I, I want to touch quickly on something you mentioned, Jana, and like you, I was I went from extremely proud to slightly disappointed as the, as you say, the momentum has slowed down. I don't think it's ground to a halt, but it's certainly slowed. I wanted to pick up quickly on the situation yesterday with Russia cutting off the gas to Bulgaria and, and um, Poland. And we saw the prices increase to 28% yesterday. Um, there's also a report in a number of European papers that revenues have actually doubled from carbon fuels um, since the beginning of the war. Um, what I'm, My question is around what your thoughts are in terms of communication with us as citizens of Germany. And I, I think a number of European countries are wondering about that. There have been discussions should be, you know, this is this is not the silver bullet. It's not going to change everything. But we've had discussions about should we reduce the speed limits on the autobahn? What should we be doing about photovoltaic? What should we be doing about wind power? What's interesting, the only thing I've seen so far, and maybe I missed it, is a letter that came out from RDRC a couple of days ago asking us um, to drive less, um, use public transport, cycle, walk, et cetera. But I, I get the impression that the government is not saying enough to us as citizens to say this really is a serious situation. Um, and we do need to do something um, in terms of if reducing our reliance on Germany for um, on, on Russia for carbon fuels. And I suspect, unfortunately, the last country that will be cut off will be Germany. I don't think it'll be the next. I think it will be Germany. I think for two reasons. The first one is that Putin will continue to, to um, re re receive vast revenues, the majority of which will come from us. And the second one is politically, it puts us in a very, very difficult, difficult situation in terms of divide and conquer. 
splitting us with our allies here in Europe as we has this domino effect and we're the last one standing. So, you know, I, I just wanted to, to get your pers perspective on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And very quickly, Boris Ginsburg, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, a short question to Mr. Hilge. Um, if you look at the uh, Russian history and um, if you look at the government, let's say, uh, of uh, Boris Yeltsin and the government under Putin, I would like to ask um, uh, your take on a certain question. Um, is the era uh, of Yeltsin a very pro-Western Russia? Is this an anomaly of Russian history or is, in your opinion, the, the Putin era, which is very conservative, uh, government and a very um, aggressive government, as we see, or, or is, is, is the Putin era the anomaly in Russian history? So this is my question. Thank you very much. Maybe Wilfried first and then Jana has the last. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Ginsburg, for that uh, very complicated question. Um, I think uh, we should not overestimate the democratic character of, uh, character of Russia in the Yeltsin era. And I mean, uh, Putin is a result of the of the uh, of the end of the Yeltsin era. We should not forget uh, it was actually the corruption mechanisms which brought Putin into power. And uh, if we look also, for example, about the claims since Primakov on Ukrainian territories or of Russian Parliament, so there were many signs already in the middle of the line that at first Russia will not become a democratic state. Uh, and secondly, uh, the, 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 the Russian, uh, let me say, um, demands against the so-called uh, near abroad already emerged uh, before Putin and Putin adopted them and sometimes radicalized them. But I think what we have now of Putin is, of course, uh, a, a radicalization and, and something special, but it has its prehistory and not only since the Munich conference, it goes far deeper. Um, a second point, um, um, it was uh, the question on negotiations. Uh, I mean, the negotiations at the moment are sometimes going on by video conferences, uh, but at the moment, I have very much doubt about the substance. At first, Russia declared one week before that it will not only concentrate on the Donbass, but also it will keep wide territories in the south and it, it will... Uh, weaken every asset of Ukrainian economy in the South. And uh, that makes negotiations at the moment very, very difficult. Secondly, I do not see that in the team of negotiations from the Russian side is really one man with big influence on the Kremlin. I mean, Medinsky is uh, not a man of influence in the Kremlin. And Mr. Slutsky is more, let me say, a driver of ideology and scandalizing every negotiation. So I have very, very much doubt about substance. And second point, what is lacking at the moment actually are trust building measures, which are in conflicts uh, going before concrete negotiations. And here we have the big problems that the international organizations of the United Nations, but also the Committee of International Red Cross, uh, are not apparently, uh, or let me say, they, they, they are not in place, uh, even if it comes uh, to prisoners exchange or, um, or if it comes to the human, so-called humanitarian corridors. Uh, here we are lacking a third power which can systematically uh, arrange uh, uh, some things. And, um, and that is, of course, a problem because of the Russian side. The Russian side is, is uh, destroying also agree bilateral agreements. Uh, that most, mostly it is a case on the Russian side, but it is also a problem what we have to discuss where are the international organizations uh, in Ukraine and what, what, do, what, what they are substantially doing. Thank you. Many hey, thanks, Wilfried. Um, Jana, the floor is yours for summing up. Um, so I'm not an energy expert, uh, and I'm uh, wondering as much as, as you do. What I found particularly puzzling is that um, by now we have really a number of um, experts um, and different reports from different experts and institutions, um, from international experts and German experts, um, saying that um, an embargo, a full embargo, would not 
be more damaging than the coronavirus crisis, um, whereas we have a government that says without presenting really own numbers that this would lead to mass unemployment and I don't know, starving people in Germany, basically, and, and kind of the total collapse of the German economy. And um, so I think it's pretty hard to, to, to judge um, what is true. Um, what, I, what, I, what I know is that the government is also not very happy about the debate in the other European countries, because uh, as we've seen now with, uh, for example, uh, Bulgaria um, and to a lesser extent Poland, in Germany, the assessment is that in the European Union, it's easy to, to say that you don't need uh, Russian gas if you can count on other countries that then via reverse flow provide you um, with um, energy and, and gas. Um, and, and that uh, Germany feels a special responsibility um, also for, for other countries. That is, that is the official narrative. I think I have been maybe too naive, but I have been very much in favor um, of being uh, going um, one step uh, forward when it comes to the sanctions and oil and gas, because I mean, it's a fact that we are actually Russia's biggest um, customer. We pay um, the most money to Russia, uh, more than uh, Italy number two and China number three, which I think is very difficult to, to bear um, in, in during these, these days. Um, and I think because we cannot, or because we were so hesitant on the military uh, side for such a long time, um, I think we, we should have been leading in, in another area then. Um, so for me, it's very much the question, for me, this is a war about our future, not about only about the Ukrainian future. Of course, very much about the Ukrainian future as well, but I think we, it is in our interest to make clear that this has immense costs for Russia, because otherwise I think uh, we encourage uh, further land grabs and further, further aggression. Um, and I think it was a mistake that we didn't do enough after 2014. But there are other, um, other opinions, and I'm now actually quite positive about Habeck's latest statement. So the government, this government is, is doing a lot to reduce our dependency. Um, and um, Habeck made more progress than he thought initially. So I hope that, um, that we actually also learn, from, as I said, learn from this experience when it comes to dealing with uh, making ourselves dependent on autocracies that basically see us as um, enemies or see us as targets and, and that are, have no problem instrumentalizing dependencies um, whatsoever. And I, I, I think we should learn from this also when it comes to yeah, China and other countries. Thank you very much, Jana. I'm, I do apologize, we have um, overrun a little six minutes, um, but um, thank you very much for staying with us uh, till the end. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I, I learned a lot again. And um, uh, thank you all for, 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 for attending this morning, for your questions and comments, um, uh, for the lively discussion you also had in the chat. Um, join me in thanking our two, um, three speakers um, uh, earlier on. Uh, for joining us this morning, uh, Jana and Wilfried and Andras, um, and we're looking forward to seeing you soon again here at the German Council on Foreign Relations. <music>